The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Controlling and Conquering CLL, Guidance on Modern Targeted Options, Innovative Combinations, and Sequential Management. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash YUZ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Thanks so much for taking the time to have such a beautiful day to be here to join us today to talk about controlling and hopefully conquering uh, CLL. So I'm uh, John Gribben from Barts in London. I'm actually, uh, this afternoon I feel like an honorary uh, Billy Joel of this, uh, New York uh, um, state of mind with John Allen, Nicole and Megan, all from various institutions in New York City. Um, we're talking this afternoon about uh, targeted therapies, and uh, as we're just talking among ourselves uh, here today, I can't remember the last time I used chemotherapy for a patient with CLL, which is a great place to be. And of course, we've now got uh, the approved agents, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and zanabrutinib as the BTK covalent inhibitors are all approved. Uh, we've got the emergence of the BTK non-covalent um, inhibitors, pertabrutinib, uh, now uh, just licensed in the US. Enantabrutinib is the other uh, BTK inhibitor, which is also uh, in late phase development, and you'll see uh, the Bell Wave 8 study being updated at this meeting here. Despite all these advances, and despite the fact that we're talking about how we don't use chemotherapy anymore, we're, we're still seeing there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And just draw your attention to this um, uh, presentation, which will be at this meeting uh, here. Uh, a large database, more than 6,000 patients, following what's happened to the treatment with, of patients in the last uh, four years. And what you'll see is that although there's a good penetration into the marketplace of these agents, there's still about 20% of patients still receiving chemotherapy, and that 20% doesn't really appear to be changing all that much over the last few years. So still plenty of work left to do. We also know, of course, that the real world data that's out there shows us that we need more uh, newer agents and new ways of looking at how we plan to use these agents together. And for that group of patients who become both either intolerant or to or resistant to both BTK inhibitors and BCL2 inhibitors, their current outcome still looks very poor. And that's something that clearly many of us are working on very hard at the moment. So our goals today are for those of you who don't already know it very well, um, in which case, like Michael Griever, who's sitting over there somewhere for some reason, and say that, Michael, why are you here? You know all this already, but good to see you. Uh, we want to improve your understanding of evidence supporting these modern targeted platforms as both upfront and sequential therapies, to equip you with the skills you need to select which is the best personalized BTK inhibitor or BCL2 inhibitor platform to manage your patients, whether they're treatment naive, or when you're looking to choose what's the one you're going to use first with what's the one you're going to use second. We want to provide you with guidance on the safety, dosing, and other practical considerations with practical therapy and other innovative options in CLL. Particularly, I'd like to thank our partners. What I'd like to have you lead into now is a, is a short video from Larry Marion, who's going to talk about his journey with CLL. So if we can have the video from Larry, thanks. Uh, my name is Larry Marion. I am now 73 years old. I was diagnosed in 2005 when I was 55 years old. I was diagnosed by accident during an annual physical, which is very typical for CLL diagnoses. When I was diagnosed, I not only was diagnosed with CLL, but I had a bunch of bad markers. So I was 55 years old, had a daughter just entering high school, and was told that Basically, I had five to six to 10 years if I was lucky. Then I had a problem. BR wasn't working. I still had a lump in my throat. And what to do? At that time, it was becoming clear that a Brutinib was going to be approved very quickly. And there was great, you know, the clinical trials, the data was showing great results for the Brutinib. So I decided to stop the BR and gamble that a Brutinib would solve my problems. 
unfortunately, I gambled correct. One of my hemocs said, why don't we just switch you to venetoclax, which had been approved at that point. And so I stopped the abrutinib, went on venetoclax. 16 months later, undetectable MRD, happy camper. And that was where I stood for almost three years. I had almost three years of undetectable MRD. So I'm very grateful at this point. I am essentially eight years beyond my expiration date. You know, it, it sounds sort of funny for people with a terminal cancer diagnosis, but we're in a golden age. CLL patients have never had these kind of options before and the kind of efficacy we're seeing with some of the, with these new drugs. Uh, beginning 10 years ago with the approval of brutinib, followed by calibrutinib and now xanabrutinib, plus the BCL2, like venetoclax and others that are waiting in the wings. These are tremendously effective drugs that have a much better side effect profile than chemotherapy. And when you look at the efficacy profiles plus the uh, side effect issues, it's a slam dunk to move to these. Uh, the CLL Society was started by a medical doctor, Brian Kaufman, who had become a CLL patient. And when he first was diagnosed, there, were no, there was no real information out there, certainly no websites. The information was in medical speak. And Dr. Kaufman first started with a blog describing what he was learning, and he was describing it for patients. That led to the development of the CLL Society website, and most importantly, the support groups. The support groups are there to help people understand. We share our experiences about our symptoms, about what questions to ask doctors, what we don't need to ask doctors because we can find on the website. The CLL Society just introduced the medicine cabinet with a picture of each of the drugs in its bottle, what it is, how it works, what the side effects are. It's just an incredibly valuable resource that can save the docs time, save their staff time. The CLL Society motto is smart patients get smart care. And oh boy, is it true. I, I've been on websites, other websites, where people are getting treatments that are obsolete because they, they weren't aware of what is going on in the major CLL centers of excellence. The CLL Society makes smart patients and therefore they get smart care. So you already heard about much of the stuff that's on this slide here, uh, both in the video and in what Larry was talking about. Just a couple of points to raise here. Lots of um, patient and care support groups nationally, and many of them are held virtually. Um, there's expert access programs, educational events, on-demand seminars, COVID-19 action plan I'll talk about later. Um, a whole variety of ways that so there's just on the slide information on how you can get hold of um, these patient education toolkits uh, and the provider resource library. So uh, that's on here. So uh, there are topical support groups now available for um, physicians, uh, CLL watch and wait, veterans with CLL, support group brochures are available upon request and you can get those through uh, the website that's here for the CLL Society. And uh, there's web page uh, information coming and available in 2024, a whole variety of non-branded uh, information. There's downloadable handouts that can be printed on demand. You can get free hard copies which can be mailed upon request for your offices to be able to hand out. Uh, quick links to CLL-specific CML opportunities. And again, the website's on here. So with that, we're going to go in and th start thinking about seizing control in treatment-naive patients with BTK uh, and, and BCL2 inhibitors. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce John Allen from our first of the three New York institutions this afternoon. Uh, John, over to you.
Thank you, Professor Gribben, and uh, thank you to CLL Society and, and Peerview for, for the opportunity and privilege to be here to, to give you one leg of this important seminar today on, on BTK inhibitors in CLL. And so I'm going to start off with uh, the frontline data here, um, looking at um, first a case to kind of frame our, our discussion today. So, so uh, here we've got a patient, a uh, 73-year-old uh, female uh, with symptomatic CLL. You can see here presenting with multiple indications for treatment uh, initiation with B symptoms, uh, an elevated white blood cell count of 250,000, hemoglobin 9, platelet 70, so a rise stage 4. Uh, otherwise, relatively healthy uh, at age 73 with diabetes and hypertension and presumably well controlled, and, and fitness uh, with performance status of 1. Uh, we do see, though, very high risk disease features, DEL 17P. Uh, an unmutated IGHV, as well as a p53 mutation on top of that, which is common, uh, and uh, on top of that, a complex karyotype. So, so very high risk, proliferative disease, and somebody who's needing therapy. And so this is a, not an uncommon patient. Fortunately, though, these high-risk patients only are about 20% of people at diagnosis, uh, but they represent a unique problem uh, because we don't really know how the best way to treat them. And, and right now, it's a little bit of patient preference, a little bit of physician comfort, and kind of thoughts about where the data might be moving towards. So uh, it's an important discussion. How do we treat this patient? How do we counsel them? How do we uh, choose between our available options, our venetoclax-based approaches, uh, BTK inhibitor continuous therapies? And uh, what is that expected outcome? And maybe I can just pose a quick question. Maybe Dr. Lamana, I mean, how are you setting up um, these, uh, these discussions with your patient? When do you do it? Kind of what is your strategy and, and you know, what is your approach? Yeah, I mean, she's obviously got high-risk features, um, you know, although patients now have very good options with both the fixed duration as well as the chronic continuous therapy, I, I still am a little bit leaning towards continuous therapy and BTK uh, inhibitor-based therapy for a patient who has all the negative features, which mm -hmm. she does, although that doesn't mean that that's going to be her only treatment, although she is 73, uh, and this is far better than what we used to do with chemoimmunotherapy, so that shouldn't be offered at all. Um, and we can argue and give our opinions about the time-limited approaches as well for somebody who's high risk, but I still give chronic continuous BTK uh, uh, in this individual, knowing that I still might have to do something later on. One of the advantages you have, of course, in CLL, although it's hugely important to be doing the TP53 mutation analysis right at the time you're giving treatment, is that usually you've had time to be spending and you know, spending time with the patient, informing them about the fact that they've got high-risk features before you get mm -hmm. to that point. And of course, the very fact that she's got high-risk features, just highlight again, it's not an indication for treatment in itself. It's still right. watch and wait until Agreed. you get there. But you've normally got some time to get people to come to terms with the fact that they're not your everyday garden patient. So right. usually you've had some time to get the patient used to it. Yeah? Uh, absolutely. So we start planting these seeds many months, uh, if not years ahead of time, honestly. Uh, uh, before we make that treatment decision. So we're not surprised when we need to have this very complicated discussion. Dr. Lamont, are you telling her that she's going to live a normal life expectancy, this type of patient, with these new therapies at age 73? Well, she is Whatever 73. that might be. No, I shouldn't say hey, be that. be careful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you know, obviously the outcomes are very good, even in these individuals with high-risk disease. Although, as I said, that doesn't mean this may be her only treatment. But the good news is we obviously do have a lot of potential salvage therapies for her. So, you know, the fact that she is older, you know, that it could be that she could. I mean, normally, if for a younger person, we'd say that their, that their overall survival is likely probably a bit compromised compared to normal controls. But given the other options of other therapies sequentially, you know, potentially, if she doesn't transform, she might be able to go from one salvage therapy to another between Ven-based therapies, non-covalence, and so on and so forth, and other clinical trials with uh, obviously novel mechanisms of action that are exciting as well. She has potential options, so she could potentially live to her whatever age. So you see a, de a decade horizon at least. You might be there, yeah. Yep. Great. Very optimistic. And um, so, you know, this is, brings up the question of this long-term data. Uh, how does this really inform us? How does this make us comfortable with these decisions? 
uh, what are these safety considerations? And now we've got three available inhibitors. Which one are we using? How do we choose them? What are those differentials that we're looking for? And you know, we're going to see data at this uh, at this ash about uh, anti-CD20 added to a calibrutinib that I, I think we got to. You know, we, we can't ignore it really anymore sometimes here. So we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll see some of that data. Dr. Thompson, you know, what is an unmet need for this high-risk patient that you see? What are, what's an important question that you kind of want to see answered maybe in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, as we all alluded to, a lot of good um, frontline therapy options and um, as Dr. Lamana kind of pointed out, we don't have randomized data to make that decision, but um, subgroup analyses might favor a covalent BTK inhibitor continuous therapy, but a lot of emerging data also with doublet and triplet fixed duration therapies. I think one of the bigger unmet needs actually is going to come to that subsequent therapy and how we sequence these uh, patients, um, especially with the emergence of the non-covalent BTK inhibitor class. Um, and so uh, longer-term data, not just from the initial treatment, but thinking about what the subsequent therapy should be and if we have any data to really guide sequencing. Amazing. And so we're going to see a lot of that throughout this seminar. And uh, this was just a nice kickoff and an initial discussion to start getting some thoughts out there and, and uh, uh, to start helping us uh, you know, understand and incorporate this data. So here's our, uh, here's our NCCN guidelines here in the U.S. that we use and follow. Uh, as you can see, we've got preferred options on the left here in the first line, and uh, uh, that, that includes a calibrutinib plus or minus OBIN, VEN, OBIN, with OBIN. It does add something. I'm very, very convinced of that. And then, and then xanabrutinib uh, to, to venetoclax uh, particularly, and then xan uh, xanabrutinib here as a monotherapy. Um, and then, uh, you know, ibrutinib, uh, still an effective drug, very effective drug, changed the world. So here is kind of some of this data that is kind of making us question uh, the role of anti-CD20 and uh, where uh, does that fit in into the treatment. And so we're going to see uh, at ASH uh, an abstract of an updated now six-year follow-up of Elevate TN. As a reminder, this is a calibrutinib obinutuzumab versus a calibrutinib versus chlorambucil obinutuzumab. This did include DEL17P patients. And what we're seeing is each year follow-up, this difference between AG plus A continues to widen and, and with additional follow-up. And this is something I think I've been on record five years ago saying six months of anti-CD20 is probably not going to, we, we knew rituximab wasn't adding anything, but we do know obinutuzumab is the superior agent in CLL uh, as an anti-CD20, and we continue to see this difference. And so um, right now we haven't been seeing these overall survival differences, but, but clearly patients are, are staying in remission. The responses are deeper, there's higher MRD, and um, you know, clearly this might have some impact on a longer term outcome. As a historical reference, five year uh, progression free survival with ibrutinib monotherapy, which set that uh, benchmark, is about 70%. So you can see uh, at 78% now at six years, the AG arm is above that. Uh, and the Resonate 2 data, which has about seven and a half years of follow up, the PFS median was not met yet at 57%. And so we can see that these drugs are tracking historically well along with that in the monotherapy arm. Um, and so Bringing into this question, how are we going to incorporate this? And I think we'll have more discussions and questions around this as, as time goes on. And please, please go to the abstract to see the, the data presented. So we also have Xanabrutinib now, which will uh, had a update uh, over the summer. This is uh, with, from the Sequoia study. This is a big study that has several cohorts in it. Uh, in this study, specific uh, cohort here, DEL17P patients were excluded. They were funneled into cohort two and cohort three of the Sequoia study. But what we see here now, it, a good follow-up of close to four years, a little three and a half years or so, 42 months. Um, xanabrutinib continues to separate itself from BR. Not that this is surprising, but we're seeing that xanabrutinib as a monotherapy is performing just like we see with the other BTK inhibitors. And this led to the approval of xanabrutinib in the frontline setting uh, with this study here. Um, and so we, uh, uh, the, the uh, four, three and a half year mark of 82.4%, again, tracking historically well with what we know from BTK inhibitors in the frontline setting as a monotherapy. 
The question is, does adding the anti-CD20 matter? We know rituximab does not seem to add much to ibrutinib, and this set the you know, kind of standard for how we use BTK inhibitors as monotherapies. And um, uh, because rituximab didn't seem to add to CR rates, MRD negativity rates, PFS, uh, or long-term overall survival. Uh, there was one study with ibrutinib with obinutuzumab. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't have the monotherapy arm, so we couldn't really glean is obinutuzumab adding to that. And so the Elevate study is really the one and only study that we've had that has shown an anti-CD20 benefit in terms of PFS uh, added to a BTK inhibitor, in this case, a, a calibrutinib. Uh, here is that data again, Elevate TN. This is the five-year data on the bottom, uh, bottom half here, and you can see that it continued to widen with an additional year, now 16% difference uh, up from, uh, what is that, 12. So you might think, okay, let's give the anti-CD20 to the highest risk patient out there. Um, and, and I think we have been tempered a little bit by, and again, confused by how to, to, to do this and to what to make of this, because it looks like early on in the Elevate study, um, the mutated patients were the ones seemingly really benefiting from the anti-CD20 with further follow-up starting at around four years. The unmutated patients actually started to show a difference in a ben benefit uh, in terms of a progression-free survival by the addition of the anti-CD20. Um, Matt Davids went back and looked at all of the patient factors that might predict for improved outcome in terms of PFS with the addition of the anti-CD20 and essentially found that every single patient would benefit except those with the highest risk features of complex carry type in del 17 p as you can see on the bottom curve there. Um, and so, uh, again, who is that patient? Who is the right patient? It does add some complications to the treatment regimen. It is an infusional therapy for six months, and, and we do know of the B-cell debleeding effects, particularly from the pandemic era, uh, that it can have some infectious risks to it, and it's not necessarily completely benign therapy. Um, and so I think that is the question we've been having. How, how uh, low does the number needed to treat need to go before we start to really incorporate it in the, in the face that, that doesn't seem to have an overall survival benefit? And so uh, unfortunately, the highest risk patients who I think would make it a slam dunk, the highest risk patients, if they benefited, these would be the ones that are getting it. We're not actually seeing that based on this study. So. What is the data support for the del 17 p patients? And so we have um, some benchmarks that have been laid out. Uh, and um, I was fortunate to, to uh, help lead and, and be a part of this pooled study that was one of the first kind of studies out there that, that really gave us an idea of what is a four-year benchmark for these patients with uh, P53 disruption. And so we pooled three, uh, four studies uh, that included um, del 17p patients, and remind you, many of these frontline studies actually excluded deletion 17p, but they could have been enrolled with p53 mutations that were then found secondarily uh, on a central review, et cetera. And, and we pooled all of the studies, those that included del 17p, those that included that, or, uh, that found the patients that had p53 mutations. Um, and mind you, these are mixed studies. So some actually use it in anti-CD20, some were monotherapies, and it's a mixed population as you would expect from pooled analysis. But what we found from this of 89 patients, which was one of the larger studies, uh, these studies all enroll about 20 patients each. So it's really been always difficult to look at one study and make any statistical inference. Uh, so here we had 89 patients enrolled, and what we found is that the PFS of these patients at four years was 79%, with an overall survival of 88%. Uh, in other talks that I've done, I would then put up the Resonate 2 study, which excluded DEL17P patients, and you looked at the PFS at four years and is right around 75%. So uh, it was the first gleaning that this, this high-risk feature seemingly might have been overcome. Uh, I do think that uh, it's not completely overcome as we start to look at longer-term data, but it is clearly better than anything we've ever been able to provide for these high-risk DEL17P patients. This is not unique to ibrutinib. A calibrutinib, uh, Matt Davids led a, a group there looking at 65 patients uh, pooled from those studies that included these high-risk patients, and again, found very similar PFS. I think at four years, it was 77%. Overall survival was around 88%. Um, and then obviously, we've got Sequoia that has a cohort two, which is all DEL 
P included patients, all being treated uniformly, and frankly might be the best actual true benchmark of what to expect with a monotherapy BTK inhibitor in these types of patients. That has now been followed out to at this 42 month mark, um, and again, tracking historically well with, with the data that we've seen from the pooled uh, evidence. And so I think it's overcome a lot, but I, I'm not so certain uh, long term that it, it, it's going to be there. And, and I do think we might start to see PFS differences as time goes on, particularly uh, in that Sequoia study where they're all Del 17P. These patients are very, very high risk, obviously. 80% are have the other allele mutated and uh, um, uh, are an at risk patient population. Here uh, is just some prospective data that uh, is looking at. Um, from the Illuminate study and the, um, the Alliance study that, that enrolled DEL17P patients that, again, evidence that uh, BTK inhibitor continuous therapy treatment, in this case, added with an anti-CD20, uh, is essentially overcoming uh, uh, an adverse PFS because the PFS looks the same whether the, the deletion 17P is present or absent in these two cohorts. Small numbers, 20 in each, in each study, but regardless, continuing with this idea that BTK inhibitors are overcoming this historically adverse event feature in a continuous treatment manner. So um, uh, here is kind of, I summarized all of this data already. We're going to see uh, the median PFS since Elevate TN did enroll uh, subjects with P53 disruption. Uh, we're going to see this updated data. Uh, and uh, it looks like, um, you know, th the median PFS is met. I just showed you some median PFS that's not being met yet th there. So we're seeing uh, it being met in these higher risk patients. And so I think uh, I, we got to see the data. We got to see what it looks like and, and try to understand it. But um, this is phenomenal, this is unprecedented, and uh, really a tough thing to uh, overcome and, and try to beat and, and to ignore uh, in, as a way to treat these types of patients. So here's uh, just the, I'm not gonna get into this too much, but the counter to this of why we're thinking maybe continuous treatments are the best approach maybe for these types of patients. Dr. Lamont is going to go over this much more in depth, but we see those patients with P53 disruption from the CLL14 study, getting venetic laxobinutuzumab, one year of treatment, uh, stopping therapy, they are having an inferior progression-free survival, a median PFS of four years. I just showed you a lot of data where those patients even ha have not had a median PFS now approaching about uh, six plus years. Um, what we've not shown is that this is causing an overall survival detriment, and I think that's going to be an important thing to follow up long term. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously, if we start to see these patients having inferior survival because they transform or there's some other issue while they are off of therapy or that disease comes back uh, more revved up, I think that's something we're going to have to pay attention to. Uh, right now, we've never demonstrated that. So this is a very still reasonable option, and you can argue maybe a best approach. You're trying to eliminate these clones. You're getting to an MRD negative state. Maybe that prevents a transformation. Um, but is fixed duration the approach, or is there a patient group within this that we can actually do that for? Um, so the other aspect of BTKs and, and uh, the challenge of uh, using these drugs is choosing one of them. And so what do we know? Um, we, here's the, ki the famous kinome screens. We've seen these uh, time and time again at many of these uh, seminars. Uh, we know ibrutinib is a pretty clean drug in the term of TKIs, uh, but with technology, with advancements, with research, um, uh, other second generation drugs have been developed to be more selective, have less off-target effects. That for years was based on the potential and phase two data showing lower rates of all these BTK inhibitor class effects. Um, and it wasn't until we finally got head-to-head -head studies that we actually really felt comfortable to ourselves and proved to ourselves that in fact these second generation drugs do and uh, have less uh, side effects. We know that tech plays a role. BTK hits both BTK and tech. They're both in platelets. Tech is the main, um, uh, one of the platelet activation pathways uh, that, uh, that signals through that. And so when you have a drug that inhibits both of that, you can inhibit platelets. Now, um, uh, that is occurring in all of these drugs. It's not completely free and clear, and it's not completely the entire pathway there. Uh, but we see by having less tech inhibition 
less off-target BTK uh, inhibition, you might, in fact, have improved bleeding and bruising. Um, and then uh, the lack of EGFR, we have less rash, diarrhea, other, uh, these other things that uh, seemingly have been improved with these more second-generation drugs. Here is the Elevate RR that was the first to kind of show us and prove that the hype was real, that uh, calibrutinib uh, in fact has um, uh, equal efficacy, because at this point, no head-to-head -head had actually been done in terms of efficacy, uh, as well as in toxicity. But in this study, high risk only, del 17 p 11 q relapse refractory patients, uh, median, um, I think, three lines of prior therapies, uh, or two lines of prior therapies, and um, uh, what we see here, the median PFS was the same. Acalabrutinib was not inferior to ibrutinib, but uh, it did show, particularly uh, in terms of AFib flutter, a 9.4% versus 16% at this kind of four-year mark. Uh, hypertension, 9.4 versus 23%. Uh, any grade kind of new hypertension, which is maybe a unique feature of acalabrutinib uh, in terms of the hypertension, as well as uh, slightly less bleeding with acalabrutinib as well. Um, and you saw less treatment discontinuations at the, at the time mark here, 14.7 versus 21% due to an adverse event, so a more tolerable drug. When you looked at of ad ad adverse event burden scores, again, kind of in a post hoc analysis, kind of summarizing this with longer term data and large numbers of patients being treated, we saw that um, clearly AFib, hypertension, and bleeding were higher with ibrutinib, whereas we still saw headache being an issue with the CALA, though it's low grade, usually goes away, can be a little pesky, um, can be managed with caffeine and things like that, and, and cough, which, you know, for the most part is not a major, major uh, issue or impediment by, by using these drugs, but it was one thing that we do see with the calibrutinib that we don't typically see with the others. Alpine was done, um, not to be outdone. Uh, Xanabrutinib here, show, uh, this was a head-to-head -head study and a relapse refractory patient population, one prior line of therapy, all comers, uh, not just restricted to the highest risk del 17 p 11 q uh, And now we've got uh, an update, uh, I think, well, not I think, we were gonna see an update at this ASH as well uh, of this, but at the previous publication that uh, Dr. Brown actually presented last ASH uh, in one of the uh, late breakers, um, we see that the PFS at the two-year mark in, uh, favored the xanabrutinib 79.5% versus 67%. So the first time, in fact, that we saw a superior progression-free survival of head-to-head -head BTK inhibitors. Um, and now, obviously, these were unblinded studies. There's a lot of kind of picking apart these types of patient populations, which are very different. And so, but at the end of the day, a phase three randomized study showed that xanabrutinib did have uh, this progression-free survival benefit at this two-year mark. What we see here is that, again, Xanabrutinib proved the point that it was less toxic. And, and when we say that, we usually are talking about cardiovascular toxicity. That's the really big clinical problem that we see with our patients. That's the one we want to avoid. It can be life-threatening even. Um, we see cardiovascular deaths and sudden deaths and ventricular arrhythmias. That's really what we're focused on, on trying to mitigate. Uh, Xanabrutinib clearly does that, 5.2% versus 13.3%. It's not zero, acalabrutinib's not zero. We see BTK class effects of all of these agents. We just see them mitigated and less with these more second generation, more selective drugs. Uh, interestingly, xanabrutinib uh, has similar rates of hypertension uh, than ibrutinib in this study, and we can kind of continue to see this, but there's a, this uncoupling of hypertension and AFib, which kind of in the ibrutinib story always seemed to go together as there was more hypertension, you saw more AFib, uh, but whereas we see similar rates of new onset hypertension, uh, we don't see the AFib coming out. Uh, bleeding, also rather similar between this. Now, uh, you know, the bleeding is not a major, major problem. It's usually cosmetic. It's usually low grade. It's, it's bruising. It's ecchymosis. Patients can be bothered by it, though. You know, there are many times, you know, it's these, these huge, you know, purple areas on arms that are kind of just a cosmetic issue. Uh, their disease is well controlled, but, you know, it can be bothersome, and these are, these are quality of life things that we need to, to keep in mind. Um, but we saw similar rates with xanabrutinib and ibrutinib. 
Um, and and I, uh, there was, uh, at the earlier time mark, a difference in that discontinuation due to AEs. Here's the Al Alpine follow-up. Uh, this overall response rate was superior. Uh, you can argue the value of that in CLL in general. Uh, and then we see the deepening responses um, here and, and the discontinuations now looking a little bit more similar between the two arms. So BTK inhibitor class effects are there, uh, and uh, we, we have to be cognizant of those. Um, the most common AEs, uh, hypertension, neutropenia, that seems to be a little bit of a, a signal with new, uh, XANU as well, uh, though not commonly a major, major problem. We can usually keep patients on drug. Uh, but major, major differences in uh, cardiovascular events discontinuing drug. Uh, so, to summarize the safety experience, we don't give these concomitantly with warfarin. We can do it with DOAX. We try to avoid the, the anti-vitamin uh, K antagonist. Um, hypertension, we manage with hypertensives. We're still trying to learn the best, uh, the best hypertensive regimen that to use for our patients. Um, and then, obviously, rate control, get them to see a cardiologist, manage the AFib, and you can typically manage our patients still ongoing with the BTK inhibitor and not have to flip out of the class. Uh, monitor for that bleeding and monitor for infections. Um, a calibrutin of the unique headache, caffeine, acetaminophen seems to help. Xanabrutinib, neutropenia is there, unique, and uh, uh, usually dose interruption and or some growth factor, and, and as time goes on, you clear that CLL out, you can usually uh, see it go away. Uh, we've got pirtobrutinib available, obviously, uh, as well, and, and also there's data of cycling between all of these agents, and so sometimes we just flip the one that we were in to a different agent. If it's ibrutinib, either a cala or xanu. If you're on xanu, maybe potentially to a cala. There's no data going that way, but there is data of Cala to Xanu. So we, we, we funnel around with these depending on the side, side effects and toxicities. Again, I don't want to belabor this. There are uh, uh, CYP3A4 issues here, so inducers or um, inhibitors. Be cognizant of what your patient is doing, con med, rex, uh, working with your pharmacist to identify any of these interacting meds. And then there are clear, clear um, uh, resources out there to, to help guide you on what should the dose be depending on the drug that the patient might be on. All right, so uh, to, to recap, this is a patient on a continuous BTKI. I think we, there's a consensus maybe here that a BTKI continuous therapy is probably our best option right now for this type of patient. Uh, maybe uh, not, we're usually just choosing a more selective second generation drug. That role of anti CD20 remains unclear for CLL patients in general, but I think maybe is a little bit even murkier for the Dell 17P and, in fact, maybe evidence against it. Uh, fixed duration is still a reasonable approach. What is the best fixed duration? Is it doublet combinations uh, or, or other uh, VENG approaches? But uh, we'll learn more from CLL 17, and, and Dr. Lamont is going to talk about that. And uh, I'll just summarize this. These second gens are out there. They've improved tolerability. They look good in high-risk groups. Activity accommodations are coming around. That's where our second part of this seminar is going. Uh, and um, overall, BTKI-based regimens have really revolutionized how we're managing our, our lymphoma patients and CLL in particular. I'll kick this back over to Dr. Gribben to talk more about the CLL Society. Uh, you heard a lot about okay. the three most important tests that we have, the ones that we kind of highlighted here that John highlighted as being associated with the poor prognosis, FISH, TP53, and IGHP. These were, of course, vitally important in that era when we were still using chemotherapy. And, of course, when the new targeted therapies first came out, there was initially that thought, well, the targeted therapies overcome these poor prognostic features. But as you heard from John, they don't always overcome it completely. And we can still select which of these agents to do. So it's very important that we remember these tests. The, the immunoglobulin mutational status will not change over time, so it can be done at any time in the patient's history. It's one of the ones that can be done at the time of original diagnosis. It won't change. Very important you repeat your FISH and TP53 at the time you're making the decision to treat because that can evolve. And even if you've done it relatively soon beforehand, it can always evolve right before you give treatment and it may make you do it. So it is important, as you've heard there, when do you do them? Well, I've already talked about that and how these tests are available. If they're working in a site that's not got these tests readily available, the CLL Society will be able to help you to identify exactly where to send these samples off. So with that said, on to the Upper West Side now for, um, <laughs> for uh, Nicole to talk about moving forward with fixed duration platforms. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gribben. 
my esteemed panel peer review for having me today. Much appreciated. So we're going to talk about fixed duration platforms. Great job. Uh, we're going to take the same patient case, 73-year-old Susan, uh, still having obviously a, a marked lymphocytosis and her hemoglobin is 9 and uh, her platelets are 70. But now she has bulky lymphadenopathy. She does not have a deletion 17P or P53 mutation. She is unmutated. Um, after discussing with her, because obviously these big discussions become more lengthy, given all our options of therapy currently, uh, she would like to achieve a deep remission as a goal of her therapy. So, in the discussion, uh, is achieving an MRD negative remission a useful outcome? What other goals of therapy should be discussed? What are the logistical considerations with time-limited venoclax-based platforms? And when pairing with obinutuzumab, what are the recommendations for tumor lysis? How would you decide between fixed duration platforms or continuous BTK therapy? And what would offer the greatest chance of MRD negative remissions? And will BTK BCL2 based platforms play a role in this setting? What is the current practice in the EU versus US? Now, obviously, I'm going to talk about all this, but just to, to talk a little bit with my colleagues here, and maybe you know, we can talk about there's many VEN based platforms that we're going to talk about. And John, given the difference now with the EU versus the European, what do you think about this? And in, how have you incorporated that in your practice? Since I left um, the Boston and went back to London, this is the first time I can remember having access yeah. to a, a right. combination that you don't have. So this is a real unusual circumstance for me to be in. But yeah, the Bruton of Veneticlax is licensed and approved in the US, gives an option of a fixed duration therapy that you don't have here yet, although we're going to show you the data. And um, I know, Nicole, you're going to go through all this, so I don't want to kind of talk the labor of the fact too much, but I can't remember discussing with a patient someone who doesn't prefer the idea of the concept of fixed duration rather versus a therapy for the rest of their life, unless you get the opportunity to discuss the nuances of some of the things that John talked about. So yeah, that combination then becomes a very attractive because it attracts, uh, uh, lands up talking about both of those issues. Um, you cannot use fixed duration with a BTK inhibitor alone. It does not drive deep remissions, as we know. You're, you're no point talking about MRD to patients with BTK inhibitors. The number of MRD negative patients in those circumstances is very, very small indeed. But if, if it's important for a patient of fixed duration and it's important for them to come, become MRD negative, then the, the dual combination is an attractive way forward. And of course, you're going to go through all the data about the clinical trials that are going to address what's the right way to do it. So I won't say anything more than that. Fair enough. OK, so let's just go on. So just to update everybody uh, with the CL14 study, obviously, this is the, the time-limited approach with venetoclax and obinutuzumab versus obinutuzumab and chlorambucil. Remember, this is 12 months in duration in the untreated uh, patient population. And here we now have six years of follow-up with the median PFS, about 53% for venetoclax obinutuzumab versus 22% with obinutuzumab and chloramcil. So uh, very tremendous efficacy with this time-limited approach that has now been obviously approved and has changed our landscape. Um, in different subgroups of patient analysis, here's the IGHV uh, patients. And you can see here, though, the unmutated patients with venetoclaxobinutuzumab does drop off a little bit compared to the mutated patients. Again, still very efficacious um, in comparison to obinutuzumab, chlorambucil, but there is a drop off for the unmutated folks that is noted. Uh, when we talk about, un, you know, MRD, and obviously that's what John was talking about, these having these fixed duration platforms, you know, there's obviously a sense of the notion that if you can get deeper uh, levels of remission, then hopefully the response duration and time to next treatment will obviously be further away. And obviously we're going to, uh, trying to standardize uh, how to detect MRD is an ongoing discussion uh, with uh, flow cytometry and NGS-based uh, platforms, uh, and different studies have done this differently, so you do need to pay attention when you're comparing different studies. But here in the CL14, this was done via a clonoseq assay, and you can see that the patients who had a greater depth of undetectable MRD, less than uh, 10 to the minus fourth, obviously did better than the patients who had greater than 10 to the minus fourth, which is the red curve on the right. Um, and so this is important, and you, and you can see the comparisons between peripheral blood and bone marrow. And obviously, going forward, hopefully we'll be able to, with more sensitive techniques, be able to equalize peripheral blood and bone marrow testing, so you really don't have to then be doing this on bone marrow. But I do think in some of the clinical trials where we've seen them done uh, in both compartments has been important, so we can see that there 
uh, become more standardized and equal across. So hopefully we'll be moving away from doing uh, bone marrows, uh, you know, in the future. Although they're still important, um, we won't get into that for certain subsets of patients, depending upon what they need. Um, in terms of now oral-oral combinations uh, for time-limited approaches, obviously there's a rationale to do this uh, because of the different complemental effect between the two different uh, therapies. Venetoclax does a very good job at mopping out the bone marrow disease, and obviously the BTK inhibitors do a great job at uh, reducing lymph node bulk. Bulk. There's not overlapping toxicity profiles, although to be fair, there's still some GI issues with, both with BTK inhibitors and venetoclax. Um, so the GI issues are not necessarily not overlapping. Um, but obviously the goal would be that there would be reduced likelihood of resistance for these time-limited combinations with both our uh, both these excellent drugs and the potential for highly effective time-limited therapy. Now most of our long-term data has been with the combination of abrutinib and venetoclax in this setting. This is the MD Anderson uh, experience. Uh, initially, this started, uh, it, it is now 24 cycles of abrutinib and venetoclax. Initially, it was a little bit less than that as a 12-month therapy, and then this got extended with some uh, protocol amendments. But you can see now, and this will be presented abstract 4635 on Monday, so please stay tuned, that the five-year outcome with the abrutinib and venetoclax, the PFS is 90%. The overall survival is 96%. And for patients with high-risk disease, deletion 17P or P53, um, the five-year PFS is 86%. And so this is excellent, an excellent combination. And then we talk about, this is probably, you know, with longer follow-up, when we talk about time-limited approaches, even perhaps for our most high-risk patients, perhaps with a oral-oral combination, we might then say, hey, maybe we won't do continuous, you know, therapy as we just talked about with that, the previous patient who had a 17P, if the results are this good, so stay tuned. But, but this is, uh, you know, achieving excellent results for patients even with high-risk disease. Now, of course, we have another study, the Captivate study, and Dr. Allen's presented this previously. This is a study that looked at both um, a fixed duration as well as an MRD-guided cohort uh, duration. Um, this was uh, three months of abrutinib lead-in followed by uh, 12 months of the combination of abrutinib and venetoclax. Um, and this is in terms of an update for the fixed duration cohort here. Um, you can see the four-year follow-up um, with an excellent PFS, a four-year PFS here of 79% for all treated patients. But you do see a drop-off with the unmutateds a little bit, and you do see a drop-off with the patients with deletion 17P or P53. Again, still being very good in the four-year uh, PFS for them at 73 or 63% respectively, um, but um, uh, excellent, again, uh, compared to chemoimmunotherapy. But of note, with the time limit, it's still a drop-off a little bit. Now, there also will be a uh, update at this meeting, Abstract 633, on Sunday um, with the five-year update of the fixed duration of Captivate, um, as well as an arm that talks about abrutinib retreatment. So here you can see there have been 53 patients who had already progressed um, after the fixed duration, and a subset of them, uh, 28 of those patients, were retreated with abrutinib. Um, after a median time on retreatment of 17 months, the overall response in 21 of the 28 that were evaluable was 86%, the majority, again, being PRs and PRLs because we wouldn't expect complete responses in just monotherapy with a BTK, but uh, again, able to retreat those individuals who got oral-oral combination and resalvage them. So this is very encouraging data, and the overall um, fixed duration cohort now at five years of the update, 54-month PFS of 70% and the overall survival at 97%. Um, so again, uh, very good efficacy with this time-limited combination of 15 months of therapy of abrutinib and venetoclax. Uh, and you can see how well they do also in patients with high-risk disease, deletion 17P or TP53, the complex carrier type unmutated um, with the 54-month PFS in the table on the right. Now, what about moving on to our colleagues overseas? Here's the FLARE data that's been presented previously by Dr. Hillman. Now, this is a little different. This is a brutinib and venetoclax in an MRD-guided uh, uh, fashion um, uh, versus FCR in upfront untreated CLL patients. And essentially what this study did is a brutinib was front-loaded for two months to then debulk, uh, and then venetoclax got added in with the ramp-up as usual. Um, and then the abrutinib and venetoclax was given anywhere from up to from two to six years. And so the way that was given in MRD-guided fashion is that patients were first tested uh, via flow cytometry for MRD at 12 months, uh, and then every six months until if they achieved MRD negativity, and then they were repeated at three and six month intervals, both in the peripheral blood and the bone marrow. And so if you became, uh, if you had undetectable MRD at that point, 
that what they did was they doubled the amount of time you would be on a brutinib and venetoclax from the time you started I plus V to the time of your first negative peripheral blood testing. And so they would double that time period so you could be anywhere on the combination from two to six years of a brutinib and venetoclax. And you can see here is obviously um, the PFS of, of I plus V versus FCR was superior. At three years, it was 97% versus 77%, and at four years, 94 versus 65%. The overall survival, again, favoring ibrutinib and venetoclax. At three years, 98 versus 93% with FCR, and at four years, 95 versus 87%. So an MRD guided ibrutinib and venetoclax versus FCR. Um, this is the GLOW data. This is what uh, Dr. Gribben was referring to. This is what led to the approval, the EMA approval of abrutinib and venetoclax in Europe. Um, this is in an older, unfit uh, the patient population of I plus V for 12 months versus chemo immunotherapy. Uh, and you can see that the PFS was certainly better than chlorimicillin obinutuzumab. However, uh, just of note, there was four on treatment uh, fatal cardiac related AEs, and we'll talk about. Uh, some of this uh, when we talk about uh, as, I, as I go on further, but that's important to note in this older patient population. The Gaia study, or CLL13, uh, looked at doublets and triplets. So this was a study that uh, looked at venetoclax obinutuzumab or venetoclax obinutuzumab and abrutinib versus chemoimmunotherapy versus venetoclax and rituximab. And the venetoclax obinutuzumab or venetoclax obinutuzumab abrutinib uh, had a, a, a better PFS compared to um, chemoimmunotherapy or venetoclax and rituximab. And the majority of those patients on either VENG or VENGI uh, were able to achieve undetectable MRD at an earlier time point, and obviously this will need to be followed. But you could see that the PFS, again, on the right is better for those individuals who achieve um, uh, 10 to the minus, greater than, under 10 to the minus fourth or better compared to those on the red curve. So achieving deep levels is important for PFS. About the safety combinations, when we look at this, you know, the phase three, the GLOW, an older patient population versus the Captivate, a younger patient population. Um, in terms of the GLOW data, again, notably, obviously, the cardiac issues were related to the abrutinib um, for the abrutinib venetoclax. The infectious complications are notably for both. So do not think that just because you get chemo versus orals that you can't get infectious complications with the oral agents. I think that's important. Uh, with the Captivate uh, data, you see some neutropenia, hypertension, and infections. The grade atrial fibrillation was a little bit less, um, you know, with the younger patient population compared to the GLOW data. So I do think, uh, you know, the imbrutinib venetoclax is also easier to administer in some respects because um, of the debulking with the lead-in with the abrutinib, uh, which is re reduces the TLS when you use venetoclax. Uh, but certainly these are very highly effective strategies, but you need to consider safety, particularly in older individuals. So with venetoclax adverse events, you know, uh, John talked about, obviously, the BTK adverse events of special interest. Venetoclax has its own issues. There's more myelosuppression because it's the ability to clear out the bone marrow more effectively than the BTK inhibitors. So you do see more neutropenia. You can see more thrombocytopenia as well. Um, you can give growth factor support and dose reductions accordingly. I think infection complications, no matter what for our CL patients on therapy, always need to be monitored. Certainly, if there are severe infections, we advocate holding the therapy during that time period. GI issues, there's more diarrhea and nausea with venetoclax, although you can see diarrhea with the BTK inhibitors, as I noted previously. Most of that is very amenable to supportive care measures uh, with anti-nausea medicines and anti-diarrheal agents. And then tumor lysis monitoring, as you all know, due to this uh, prolonged ramp up that we have with venetoclax-based therapy, you need to monitor for tumor lysis. And depending upon the amount of bulk of disease, uh, starting with the, you know, whether they're high risk, intermediate, or low risk will sort of dictate what you need to do, whether it's outpatient or inpatient management accordingly um, with pre-medication with antihyperuricemics, adequate IV hydration, so on and so forth. Um, if you're going to use venetoclax obinutuzumab, usually initiate the venetoclax a little later. We know obinutuzumab can cause infusion reactions, can also cause some tumor lysis in and of itself, so you'll start that later on, but it's a great debulker also for venetoclax-based therapy to initiate the obinutuzumab first. Um, less so with rituximab, um, and so people oftentimes will start that simultaneously, although you could, you could also start it later as well. Um, and then again, you're going to uh, look at, just similarly to when you look at BTK inhibitors, you're going to also look at what other medications your patients are on uh, in terms of dose, drug-drug uh, interactions regardless. 
So what about the data with fixed duration combinations with second generation BTK inhibitors and venetoclax? So obviously you're seeing maturing, emerging data on doublets and triplets with the newer generations. And so here's AVO, a calibrutin, venetoclax, and obinutuzumab. Uh, this was a study done by Matt Davids uh, in treatment naive patients. These were high risk patient po population. 60% of them had a TP53 or deletion 17P, 24% were complex karyotype, and the majority were unmutated. Very active, bone marrow undetectable MRD was 83% in TP53 aberrant patients, and durable responses seemed to be uh, uh, so far with 93% PFS at a median follow-up of three years. There were low rates of cardiac and infectious toxicities, and you could see that the bone marrow MRD tended to improve over time. This is some of the safety data with the triplet. There's more grade three, four neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and anemia with the triplet combination. So you do have to pay attention uh, to that uh, when you're adding agents together, of course. Um, they had grade three, some mild uh, grade three non-COVID infectious complications, pneumonia and colitis. Obviously, we, this was done also during COVID period, so there was a 9% of COVID infections. Low cardiac issues uh, currently presently on this study. Um, uh, obviously, this isn't head-to-head -head comparison to abrutinib combinations, but you could see uh, with a calibrutinib low uh, ventricular or, or atrial fibrillation, there was no febrile neutropenia or opportunistic infections and no major bleeding issues, and there was about a 20% dose reduction that was needed. Here's uh, with Z ZVO or xanabrutinib, obinutuzumab, and venetoclax in the Bovin study, a small patient population, 39 patients. Uh, about 13% had TP53, so not as uh, heavily enriched for, for high-risk individuals as the prior study. 72% were unmutated, median follow-up but less mature at 26 months. 89% were un, uh, had detectable, undetectable MRD, and again, the adverse events, more thrombocytopenia, fatigue, neutropenia, and bruising noted, and grade three neutropenia. So more cytopenias when you add these agents together, particularly when you add obinutuzumab to venetoclax. So keep that in mind. There are some newer studies that will help us address these platforms going forward in a more randomized fashion. Here's CLL-17 looking at uh, abrutinib versus venetoclax obinutuzumab versus I plus V venetoclax and abrutinib. And this is for previously untreated fit and unfit patients and will include patients with deletion 17P or P53. So finally, we'll have a randomized study of monotherapy versus time limited either ven OB versus I plus V. Here's CLL-16, which will look at venetoclax and obinutuzumab versus AVO, so a calibrutin of venetoclax and obinutuzumab in high-risk individuals, um, so including deletion 17P or complex karyotype, and again, previously untreated. And then we have the AMPLIFY study, which is a calibrutin of venetoclax plus or minus obinutuzumab versus chemoimmunotherapy in treatment of CLL patients. These will not include um, high-risk individuals will not have deletion 17P or P53, uh, and the combination will be AV or AVO for a year, time-limited uh, in general, versus FCR or BR. And then we have the MAGIC study, which is a, more of an MRD-guided approach of looking at a time-limited platform, so looking at a calibrutinib and venetoclax versus venetoclax obinutuzumab. Again, they will be MRD-guided, so if they, you achieve undetectable MRD, you will stop either arm. If you have ongoing MRD, you will continue either AV for another 12 months, or you'll continue venetoclax for another 12 months. We're also seeing some emergent dating with non-covalent BTK inhibitors, and Megan will talk more about this, but uh, in the uh, Bruin study with pertubrutinib, they had some small co cohorts of pertubrutinib and venetoclax in a small number of patients, 15, and then PVR, uh, pertubrutinib, venetoclax, and rituximab in 10 patients. The overall response was high. Um, and so fixed duration pertubrutinib has been now combined with venetoclax and rituximab, and there's an ongoing phase three study currently enrolling patients looking at perto ven retux versus ven retux a la the Murano study, uh, and there'll be an ASH update uh, at abstract 3269 on Sunday, so stay tuned for that as well. So let's go back to Susan. Um, so now you have, um, you know, she's 73, she has the same comorbidities, she has bulky lymphadenopathy, she does not have a 17P or P53, she is unmutated, however, but she would like to get, a, a, her goal is a time-limited approach, uh, or MRD. So here, VENG is a very good option for this individual. Um, uh, alternately, you could give chronic continuous BTK. 
uh, however she wants to achieve MRD and get off therapy. And then, of course, BTK Ven is certainly an option, um, although recently approved in Europe, but not yet approved here uh, in the U.S. And so they wait additional data from some of these other uh, phase three studies uh, with the combinations. And so be look on the lookout for those. And debulking with a lead in ibrutinib can reduce the risk of tumor lysis, making it a little bit more feasible and easier when you combine that with venetoclax, giving the Ven obinutuzumab complicated ramp up. So final thoughts, fixed duration Ven OB included in practice guidelines, that is true, and preferred option for treatment naive CLL patients with ability to achieve deep MRD negative responses. The BTK Ven combinations are rapidly emerging and show encouraging efficacy. Abrutinib Ven is approved in Europe, it is not yet approved here in the US. Uh, and finite therapy with a Cala or a Xanu combined with venetoclax is being assessed. And of course, doublets versus triplets is a whole nother question about what might be better. Uh, and when discussing with patients, uh, consider goals of care, toxicity profiles, and logistical aspects of time-limited therapy. And with that, I will bring Professor Gribben back up. Thank you. Great, thanks. Actually, it, it is interesting, because in Europe, the case you described is exactly the case we probably would use um, venibrutinib with, because the VenG does have that drop off the of the... So I'm using VenG for mutated and VenI for unmutated. It does come with the downside, of course, that I'm back to using ibrutinib, which is not, no longer my preferred frontline BTK inhibitor, and I, I don't have access to use the others in the combination. And uh, Megan's going to talk to us about non-covalent BTKIs, remind me that I'm wrong about pertubrutinib's approval, and look about other innovative options. Thank you, Megan. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna take us um, a step forward and really talk about sequential treatment, uh, the relapse setting, and then some of the um, emerging and even now approved strategies. Questions coming in. So we now have a patient, uh, switching gears, a different patient. Kevin is 80 years old. He was diagnosed with CLL 10 years ago. So this case is really gonna speak to the chronic nature of the disease and how we uh, sequence therapies over time. So initially, he had a period of active observation, then had symptomatic CLL, warranting uh, treatment in initiation back in 2016, and was treated with first line of Brutinib. Um, after a few years on therapy in December 2020, he relapsed on a Brutinib, so disease progression on a covalent BTK inhibitor, and then was treated with venetoclax rituximab as a fixed duration therapy of 24 cycles of venetoclax per the Murano regimen. After finishing treatment, nine months after end of treatment, he had progressive disease in September 2023, and now we're tasked with selecting his next line of therapy. So in terms of cytogenetic and molecular features, um, no TP53 aberrancy, uh, the presence of deletion 11Q, unmutated IGHV, and also Kevin's had slowly declining performance status with an ECOG uh, performance status of two currently. So some points uh, to address, kick us off with discussion are, could you re-expose this patient to venetoclax? What about switching back to a covalent BTK inhibitor in this setting? Um, so maybe, Dr. Allen, I don't know if you have any preliminary thoughts uh, about this case in these first two questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, re remind me, the, the remission was? Yeah, it was only nine months. Nine so months. finished Ven-R, and then nine months later had not only CLL relapse, but CLL warranting initiation of therapy. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, always the crux of the matter, and we don't really know. You know, the, the consensus is less than two years. Uh, people typically would not uh, retreat. Um, I've had some patients that have progressed soon after stopping the drug. Uh, I have restarted. I have gotten some, you know, remissions, but then you seem to, it, it, there, there's something resistant about that disease. So particularly with a nine-month remission, uh, I'm kind of moving on and, and switching out of the class and, and going to a uh, uh, different agent. Yeah, and then I think this is an important point. So uh, Professor Gribben, for someone who's progressed um, on a covalent BTK inhibitor like a brutinib initially, then gets treated with another regimen, would you ever cycle back to the covalent inhibitor? Yeah, that's a great question because, of course, uh, there is some data suggesting that some patients treated with venetoclax, you can eradicate the resist original resistant clone. I think uh, unless you've got good access to having good mutational analysis, 
Uh, and if you've got that, you could consider going back to it. But um, I, I think you really have to have that kind of data available, you, like you did in Ohio. <laughs> um, and then thinking ahead, and we'll review some of this data, but Dr. Lamana, what do you think about non-covalent BTK inhibitors in this setting? And um, kind of what has the clinical experience been with non-covalent BTK inhibitors in, in CLL? And we'll kind of review the data in detail, but just yeah. pre prelim yeah. clinical experience thoughts. Yeah. No, the, I mean, the data is very good. Um, for those of us who participate in the Bruin study, these patients did really, really well. Mind you, she's going to go over this data, but certainly this is a, a, a very uh, good patient example where we could use this, uh, this agent going forward, or this class going forward, I should say, since there's more than one agent. I know you're going to present the data, but I think what struck us all from the very first time we've seen it is the side effect profile of this agent it looks quite yeah. different, doesn't it? Correct. Absolutely. So um, just to review, because this patient progressed on a brutinib, um, we now know that um, in the majority of patients at the time of clinical progression on a brutinib do have mutations um, in the cysteine 481 position of the BTK protein, which is where the drug um, binds BTK. Um, and then a smaller subgroup of patients also have mutations in PLC gamma 2, um, which is the protein immediately downstream of, of BTK in the B cell receptor signaling pathway. Um, these mutations, BTK cysteine 481S being the most common, um, is a catalytically activating mutation and leads to downstream uh, B cell receptor signaling. And we're seeing more emerging data about resistance, not only in, with a brutinib now for covalent BTK inhibitors, but also with a calibrutinib. Um, so here is data presented um, at ICML. This is the Elevate RR cohort. So we saw the clinical trial data for this uh, earlier in the presentation. But you see side by side um, BTK uh, mutation resistance profiles for a calibrutinib and a brutinib, small numbers of patients still. You can see that cysteine 481S mutations were dominant with both uh, groups. However, there are many co-mutations also that you see here co-occurring. For example, T474I um, in the acalabrutinib cohort, um, as well as, for example, um, L528W in one patient with a brutinib. Um, so patterns really of mutational frequency, VAF, and uncommon variants varied a little bit between a calibrutinib and a brutinib. And here you see a diagram of the B cell receptor signaling pathway, um, and you see protein maps actually of, of BTK at the top there. And there's a bunch of mutations that are outlined here, and this is for covalent and non-covalent inhibitors. But I think what this really highlights is that there are mutations outside of the cysteine 481S uh, binding site mutation that was uh, most common uh, in the initial resistance studies with abrutinib, um, and we have seen cysteine 481S mutations now in patients treated with acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib, um, but there's also other uh, mutations that have different functional consequences emerging too with covalent uh, BTK inhibitors. So for example, still really small numbers of patients but 13 xanabrutinib uh, treated patients at the time of disease progression with sequencing. Not only were cysteine 481S mutations detected in 10 of 13 patients, seven patients progressing on xanabrutinib also had an L528W mutation. So BTK resistance mutation is certainly not standard of care currently and does not currently determine clinical practice. But I think uh, this research is important, and in the future, it might have some implications in terms of how we select different covalent inhibitors and how we sequence between covalent and non-covalent inhibitors. So here you see the most recent NCCN guidelines, um, and this is in uh, patients without DEL17P or P53 mutations, so applicable to the case we initially discussed. Um, and for patients who previously had a covalent inhibitor, um, a couple of options to highlight and walk through the data, uh, venetoclax, um, venetoclax retreatment, um, and the non-covalent BTK inhibitor pirtabrutinib. So we know that venetoclax is active in a brutinib refractory CLL. Um, this is a study published back in 2018, a phase two study of venetoclax. is venetoclax monotherapy in patients with CLL treated with prior abrutinib specifically, heavily relapsed refractory patient population, median of four prior therapies, um, and a high overall response rate, 
um, and including a 61% uh, rate overall response rate in the TP53 aberrant uh, subgroup. Here is data from the phase three Murano study. We've talked about this data uh, throughout the uh, presentation today. Um, and this uh, is, again, venetoclax rituximab as a 24-month fixed duration therapy in the relapse setting. Um, you can see uh, PFS and OS curves here. Um, overall um, superior compared to the chemoimmunotherapy control arm of bendamustine rituximab. Um, and we will highlight, though, that in the TP53 mutant subgroup, um, there does still uh, appear to be um, a significant, you know, difference between the median progression-free survival uh, for TP53 aberrant disease, so median PFS of 37 months versus 57 months for wild type. And I'll also highlight when we talk about the Murano study data um, that only five of the 196 patients in the venetoclax rituximab arm had prior B-cell receptor inhibitor therapy. We now have uh, real-world evidence as well as the evidence I just showed with the clinical activity of venetoclax following BTK inhibitor therapy. Um, but this data uh, was done at a time when really these patients were receiving prior chemoimmunotherapy. Um, I want to highlight um, some updates from the Murano data that will be presented um, on Saturday. Um, this is a follow-up of the Murano study, and really uh, what's nice about this abstract is that we're getting more data on subsequent therapies and the second PFS event, and I think this is a really important endpoint when we think about sequencing therapies in an era of fixed duration therapies. Um, so compared to BR, there was a significantly prolonged time to the second PFS event in patients treated with venetoclax rituximab. Um, and then we have some subsequent therapy um, data. So again, these patients uh, really didn't receive prior B-cell receptor uh, signaling inhibitors, um, but in the patients who did receive BTK inhibitor now after completion of VEN-R, high overall response, 86% in the VEN-R cohort. And then there's some updated venetoclax retreatment data, which I think is really important too, and we'll talk more about in this abstract, 42 patients retreated, um, 32 with a response, so 76% overall response to VEN retreatment. This is data from an international uh, multicenter retrospective study um, that we conducted uh, looking at venetoclax retreatment. Um, this was a heavily relapsed refractory patient population. Patients could have uh, received uh, venetoclax in any line of therapy and then received a subsequent venetoclax-based uh, regimen in a later line of therapy. We found an overall response rate of uh, VEN retreatment of about 80% in this cohort, including 56% of patients with prior BTK inhibitor exposure, so really a double exposed patient population cohort. And in a short median follow-up of 10 months, the median PFS for VEN retreatment was 25 months. These patients had a median uh, time of 16 months between the completion of VEN1 and VEN2, and I think this is a question that Dr. Allen was alluding to. We don't really know the optimal duration before uh, venetoclax retreatment, and I just want to highlight that there's many prospective studies going on uh, examining venetoclax retreatment following frontline VEN, which I think is going to be particularly relevant moving forward. So enter non-covalent BTK inhibitors, which may address some of the limitations that we've seen of covalent BTK inhibition. So we've talked about acquired resistance, which is a problem with the covalent inhibitors. Um, BTK inhibitor intolerance has become less of an issue with the second generation inhibitors, but we do still see patients discontinuing uh, despite the availability of acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib. And then we have this new challenge that we're being faced with in the clinic. That's really this double exposed CLL patient, a patient who has had already a covalent BTK inhibitor and venetoclax and needs additional therapy. And this has been a historically poor outcome group as highlighted earlier in the presentation. So pirtabrutinib, nimtabrutinib are two of the examples of the non-covalent BTK inhibitor class. I'm going to focus mostly on pirtabrutinib, uh, which we heard is now FDA approved for uh, CLL after BTK and BCL2 inhibitor therapy. It's a highly selective 
uh, non-covalent BTK inhibitor, it binds reversibly to the BTK protein, which distinguishes it from the covalent inhibitors. And this is the waterfall plot from the Bruin phase 1-2 study. Um, looking at patients, all of these patients had prior covalent BTK inhibitor therapy. And you can see in the light blue and dark blue, these patients may have discontinued the prior uh, covalent BTK inhibitor for either toxicity or disease progression. High overall response rate, 82%. In the double exposed patient population, very high overall response rate, 79% as well. And I will say that the responses were seen regardless of cytogenetic and molecular characteristics. And of particular interest, patients with BTK cysteine 481S mutations uh, have responses to peer to brutinib. Here we see the PFS data. So at a median uh, follow-up of 19 months, we have a median PFS of 19.6 months here. And we see that peer tabrutinib is efficacious in patients who are that double exposed cohort. So prior BTK inhibitor and BCL2 inhibitor therapy. Here we have a median follow-up of 18 months, median progression-free survival of 16.8 months. And these responses, when we compare to historical retrospective um, data for double exposed patients, this is quite a good outcome. So now um, we're going to see at this ASH meeting some longer follow-up of the Bruin study, about 30-month follow-up currently. And we see uh, durability of responses with peer tabrutinib really regardless of prior BCL2 inhibitor status. So in the presentation, you're going to see uh, patients um, not only the overall response rate, which is 72%, but looking by prior BCL2 inhibitor exposures, exposure. So in the naive patients, median follow-up of 22 months with an overall response rate of 83%. Um, at a median follow-up of 15.9 months, overall response rate of 79% in those with prior BTK uh, or, sorry, prior BCL2 inhibitor exposure. Um, Professor Gribben was alluding to the AE profile of peer tabrutinib specifically, um, and here we highlight um, AEs of special interest, really AEs that have been characteristic of the covalent BTK inhibitor class. Um, you see the most common grade three or higher adverse event is infections, which is a common uh, challenge given um, this is a cancer of the immune system. Um, neutropenia uh, follows that at 26% of patients having grade three or higher neutropenia. The Bruin study did allow growth factor use, and so um, uh, the neutropenia uh, experience can be managed um, with growth factor. And then low rates, um, in particular of grade three or higher bleeding, a grade three or higher atrial fibrillation, um, and grade three or higher uh, major hemorrhage or hypertension. So we do know that patients, um, despite this outstanding data, do uh, acquire, uh, have progressive disease on peer tabrutinib therapy. Um, and this is uh, work done from a cohort uh, at our center of relapsing patients um, on peer tabrutinib. At the time of clinical disease progression, progression, um, we sequenced these patients particular, with a particular focus on the BTK protein and saw the emergence of BTK mutations outside of that cysteine 481 position. You can see there is some heterogeneity here. In this cohort, L528W was the most common but small number of patients. These mutations uh, cluster around the tyrosine catalytic uh, domain um, of the BTK protein, and we also had several patients with pre-existing PLC gamma-2 mutations that persisted at the time of disease progression on peer tabrutinib. At this ASH, there's some updated uh, data that's going to be presented from the Bruin experience um, by Dr. Brown. Um, you see here 86 patients from the Bruin study with disease progression on peer tabrutinib. Um, the response to peer tabrutinib in this cohort was high overall, 83%, and many patients did have pre-existing BTK cysteine 481 mutations at baseline that actually cleared during treatment with peer tabrutinib, and that's been shown in a couple of settings now. Um, but I just want to highlight that overall, uh, there were BTK mutations that emerged at the time of disease progression on peer tabrutinib. In this study, T474 position mutations were the most common. There are also 27 patients um, who didn't have acquired mutations at the time of disease progression, highlighting alternate uh, 
resistant mechanisms to be further elucidated for uh, patients with CLL progressing on pirtabrutinib. So what are the next steps for pirtabrutinib and CLL? Um, well, just seven days ago, we now uh, have this FDA approved in the U.S. as monotherapy in the relapse setting. There are ongoing phase three studies, so I'll start with the 321 study. This is pirtabrutinib um, versus investigator's choice of a PI3 kinase inhibitor, idelalisib plus rituximab or bendamustine rituximab. This is in the relapse setting. Um, we saw the preliminary data of the uh, PV and PVR from the small Bruin cohort, um, and Dr. Lamana highlighted that there's a phase three of PVR versus the Murana regimen in relapse CLL. And then there's also an ongoing study in untreated patients with CLL, excluding those patients with deletion 17P, of pirtabrutinib monotherapy versus bendamustine rituximab. And just to highlight, although we don't have the time to focus on Richter's transformation, which really remains one of the greatest unmet needs in this patient population, there may be a role for non-covalent BTK inhibitors in this disease as well. And so the Bruin study does have a, a pretty large cohort for such a rare disease, 82 Richter's transformation patients treated with pirtabrutinib with an overall response rate of 50%, including some complete responses, 13% of the patient population. This is a heavily pretreated Richter's uh, transformation uh, patient population. Most patients had a prior Richter's directed therapy. And you can see the overall survival um, curve uh, over there. Uh, sh you know, still a lot of work to do in Richter's transformation, but I think this data uh, to date in such a large cohort supports further investigation with pirtabrutinib in Richter's transformation. So, Double exposed versus double refractory, we, we started to throw these terms around. Um, and so uh, what we mean by a double exposed patient, I would propose is a patient with CLL relapse after exposure to both a covalent inhibitor and venetoclax, but it does really start to matter whether this patient had disease progression on that agent or, for example, discontinued venetoclax for completion of a planned fixed duration therapy, it might not be resistant to that drug class. So a double refractory patient is really one who's had progression on both agents, a covalent inhibitor and venetoclax. And we've talked about this, but to hit home the point, the optimal treatment-free remission to be considered refractory versus exposed is still debatable. We've talked about with venetoclax retreatment, for example, maybe 24 months or two years is a, a good time point, and that's been suggested by expert opinion, but we really don't have any data to guide, you know, what is the optimal duration or treatment-free remission where we can consider venetoclax retreatment, for example, or uh, switch gears to another uh, drug class. So um, I'm just gonna throw this slide up there. We don't have time to go into the novel approaches for double refractory CLL, but Professor uh, Gribben is gonna uh, highlight some uh, emerging data from this ASH meeting of novel mechanisms of action. We've heard about non-covalent BTK inhibitors, CAR T cell therapy. There's data, for example, for lysocell in this setting, BTK degraders. Um, there's going to be some data at this meeting presented. And then we have also uh, have ongoing studies of bispecific antibody therapy in patients with CLL. So let's bring it back to our case uh, with Kevin, our 80-year-old patient who has now progressed on not only a brutinib, but progressed shortly after nine-month treatment-free remission after uh, venetoclax rituximab. I would say, given the short duration between the end of treatment with venetoclax rituximab and now relapse that requires treatment again per IWCL criteria, we should change drug class because it might be more effective than venetoclax retreatment. And now we do have the non-covalent BTK inhibitor pirtabrutinib available in the United States, and we just reviewed that there is data to support its use in this double refractory setting. Um, and pirtabrutinib has been generally well tolerated with a low rate of discontinuation for toxicity. Uh, we have some final thoughts on sequential therapy, December 2023, and CLL. So following progression on a covalent BTK inhibitor, we've seen data to support treatment with venetoclax or a non-covalent inhibitor. In double exposed CLL, if the patient had a longer treatment-free remission, and we threw around that two-year number, but we really need more data, venetoclax retreatment is an option. 
For patients with less than two years or a shorter treatment-free remission, the non-covalent BTK inhibitor pirtabrutinib is an option. And really in that double refractory patient population progression on a covalent BTK inhibitor and venetoclax previously, pirtabrutinib is an option in many clinical trials. So with that, I'm going to pass it back, um, and we're going to hear about those, some of those new options. Thanks, Meg. So what CLL Society calls its medical cabinet is nine of the most common medications. It's a non-branded, patient-friendly handout that can be printed on demand to provide information. You can get free hard copies that are available on request to have on hand in offices. And again, you can visit this on uh, uh, the website under the medicines cabinet, and you'll see these very nice information sheets that contain a lot of information that will be very useful for your patients considering these agents. So I've got the task of uh, talking about where we might go in the future, and of course, I could have spent the whole two hours talking about, any of the four of us could have spent the whole, the whole next two hours talking about where we think it's going in the future. So what we've elected to do here is just focus on some of the presentations that you'll see and ask just to point you to those presentations if you think that's interesting. What we're thinking about are the emergent BCL2 inhibitors in the same way that we've got multiple BTK inhibitors. At the moment, we've only got venetoclax as a licensed BCL2 inhibitor, but there's other emerging BCL2 inhibitors that are there. We've got dual activity BTK inhibitors. Uh, that, that is, we've heard about covalent and non-covalent, and you're gonna be hearing at this meeting about the, the covalent, non-covalent dual activity. And of course, um, uh, in our questions there, Me Me our summary, Megan did discuss, of course, already immunotherapy and things like the bispecifics. Uh, but of course, where do um, T cell engagers and other cellular therapies fit into the landscape in CLL? So Sonrotoclax uh, is a combination partner, can, looks to build upon that synergy that we heard about uh, between BCL2 and BTK inhibitors. It's a BH3 mimetic that binds to and inhibits BCL2 with a potency that's reported to be very significantly higher than that in venetoclax and biochemical studies. And Contan's going to be presenting data on this on Saturday, looking at a phase one, two study in treatment naive patients with CLL, looking at it in combination with Zanabrutinib. No surprise they chose that agent because of course it's the same company making both, but it's a very logical conclusion to be looking at a BTK inhibitor in combination with this. Uh, median follow-up still short, median follow-up on the abstract at least 8.5 months, and I'm going to be interested to see what Khan's got to say in terms of the follow-up data we've got here. Uh, high uh, overall response rates, as you see, occurring across all doses, and no progressions were reported in either cohort at this stage, but of course, longer follow-up needed, as I've already said. Jennifer Royak is going to present data on LP168, which is a selective next-generation BTK inhibitor. This one is very different in its action as, as in that it binds both wild type and a C481S mutated BTK in a covalent and non-covalent way. And Jennifer's uh, going to present data so, hypothesizing that this allows efficacy against cells with both wild type BTK through its covalent activity while preventing expansion of those common resistant mechanisms through its non-covalent activity. So again, interesting uh, class of activity. Again, follow-up relatively short, but uh, in the abstract at least, we see Jennifer presenting the data showing um, high uh, response uh, rates and uh, quite impressive uh, durations of response for most of the patients presented. And again, for those of you interested to see that, Jennifer's going to be presenting that in a talk right after Contan's uh, data on the BCL2, uh, uh, sorry, a BTL2, BCL2 novel combination. ROAR1 is an agent that's been around for a long time. It's very appropriate we're talking about it in San Diego. Tom Kipps did a lot of their very original work for this, of course, at UCSD just up the road here. Um, and ROAR1 is an oncofetal protein. It's highly expressed on hematologic and solid tumors with little um, expression on normal tissues. And uh, NVG111 is a first-in-class humanized tandem uh, um, T cell engager or by specific antibody targeting ROR1 with CD3. It, um, and it um, ex exclusively binds to the ROR1 fizzle domain. There's earlier su evidence suggesting that the avidity of uh, NVG111 monotherapy in combination with ibrutinib 
Um, we know that the monotherapy is able to induce a reduction in disease burden. Um, and now they're looking at time-limited exposure leading to durable responses in sub uh, patients. And again, this also one follows right after those other two presentations. So if you find any of this of interest, you can sit through a 45-minute session of getting all three presented for you. Tani Siddiqui's presented uh, this data before. Lots of us presented this data before at the Transcend uh, CLL004 study. It's very uh, appropriate to consider, of course, that uh, the very first adult patients treated with CAR-T by Carol June were those CLL patients. I say that those two patients have been written up in more prestigious journals than any of us can even dream about. Um, but still only those two. And we still do not have an approved uh, um, CAR-T agent. Lysa cell, of course, is the most widely ex um, studied of the CAR-T uh, agents. Of course, alone or in combination with um, um, uh, ibrutinib. And um, Tanya is going to be presenting uh, an updated data looking at the outcome of the patients on the CLL004 study. And the prime, she's going to present data showing the primary endpoints have now been met, that um, uh, an 18.4% CRCRI rate in patients with relapsed refractory CLL after both um, BTK. Uh, and venetoclax, so failure, so uh, Megan's combination of the um, ref dual refractory patient population. And uh, with longer follow-up, ELISA cell continues to demonstrate durable uh, uh, CR rates with high un undetectable MRD rates in patients with heavily pretreated high-risk CLL, and we look forward to seeing that abstract uh, presented also. The CLL Society does have resources already available for CAR-T, even though, of course, at the moment, it's only available for the CLL patients in the setting of clinical trials. Explains what CAR-Ts are in a patient-friendly term. Viewable online in a digital flip, flip book format. You can get free hard copies again, or you can visit the CLL Society or backslash CAR-T. And there's a CAR-T ambassador program that can, connects patients who are considering CAR-T with someone who's already been through it. And I think we all know how useful that can be for our patients to have the opportunity to speak not to one of us about the experience, but about another patient. CLL Society's COVID-19 action plan. We keep, every single time we think that the COVID-19 pandemic is over, we've got another variant emerging. There's another variant emerging right now. Uh, this encourages patients to create ahead of time. Of course, it's very appropriate to consider that most of us consider that the worst days of COVID are behind us because we've been vaccinated and have high levels of immunity. Lots of our CLL patients do not fall into that category and remain highly vulnerable, and many of our patients still pretty much locked at home. And the more people outside uh, in the rest of the community have thought about COVID-19, the more exposed our CLL patients who do not have immunity are. So this includes information about planning checklists, household quarantine plans, checklists for what to do as soon as you test positive, and of course our CLL patients often being able to access therapies very early in the emergence of, um, in, of COVID symptoms uh, appearing here. So just a reminder to please do mention the CLL Society to your patients. I think we all know that our CLL patients are among the patient group that I see who are most eager to know about what they can do about diagnosis. I can barely think of a CLL patient who hasn't been engaged in some way with the CLL societies and isn't already well informed. And sometimes your heart sinks when you see them walking in with more New England Journal papers under their arms as they sit down and plonk them on your desk. You know this is not going to be a short consult, <laughs> but a very rewarding one nonetheless. Uh, visiting that CLL Society website uh, does provide uh, even more empowerment uh, to ease their anxiety and a whole variety of free, process, re, uh, free resources available, as you see here. So with that, I get to now have my fun part, which is to start firing questions at the three of them. We talked a lot about venetoclax fixturations, but of course, venetoclax was originally um, designated for continuous therapy. So you've got a patient who gets to the end of a fixed duration approach. Um, do, you do you continue venetoclax? Megan, you're yeah, thinking I th there. I think that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, if I, you know, we still do have the option to do venetoclax monotherapy in the relapse setting. Um, and there are certain patients where I still do consider that sometimes, um, 
old, uh, patients with P53 aberrancy. Um, you wonder if, if continuing the Veneta class, we talked about that continuous first fixed duration. I think there's still a lack of data to compare the approaches. Um, or there's patients that just for whatever reason couldn't get the anti-CD20 antibody therapy. Um, so if they didn't follow the Murano regimen and didn't get an anti-CD20 in the relapse setting, I have continued venetoclax. There are a lot of clinical trials um, that are investigating this. You know, should we be testing um, MRD and guiding the duration of venetoclax with um, MRD testing? That's certainly not standard of care practice in the clinic. For most patients, um, I do stop in the relapse setting at, you know, as standard of care at that 24 cycle mark. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot of emerging data in the frontline and relapse setting about whether, you know, MRD might be a tool, while it's not used uh, to determine practice in the clinic today, in the future that might help us decide um, continuous or shorter or longer duration. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of our challenging issues that we get asked about from our patients all the mm -hmm. time. Are you testing our MRD? What are we doing with it? So on and so forth. And obviously, this is the area we do lack the most data. You know, first of all, you know, think about it. The, the upfront study was a 12-month duration, but sort of arbitrary. And so we don't know. This is why the FLARE trial is very interesting because, you know, here you're doing an MRD-adapted approach to therapy. And so there are some patients who extending the therapy might render them undetectable, and there are some patients who probably it doesn't matter. And so trying to parse now, you know, who those patients might be, these are hopefully some of the studies we'll get to. And then, of course, our, the MRD testing keeps changing as well, right? So the platforms of testing are, are different amongst different institutions, and depending on you, when you, where you send them out, and so on and so forth. And so, so we do need a lot more data for the majority of patients, you know, obviously who want a time-limited approach based on the efficacy of some of these combinations. They're excellent, and so you're going to want to try to get patients off of therapy, but I do think we need a lot of work in that area so that we can figure out you know, who are the patients we might extend those therapies? Did we not, did we shorten the therapy too prematurely in some of them and so on and so forth? Great point you raised there, Nicole, about, I mean, uh, we talked a lot about undetectable MRD, but it's very important you're looking at a paper nowadays, so you look at what was the methodology used to look at the MRD analysis. Was it four color flow, six or eight color flow? Is it PCR based? Is it NGS based? And how the NGS is done, is it targeted NGS? So, and of course, those have very, very different limits of detection. Um, and the really good papers kind of compare <laughs> different methodologies and talk about the importance of what that is. But I think it's very incumbent on us to look at what's actually being looked at. Um, I think um, there's a lot of questions about dosing and dose adjustments and dose modifications. But I've got a little good scenario here. David on the webcast has got a patient is treated with the brucinib, and the patient did well for 18 months, some right doubt, um, side effects. He reduced the dose to 280. Did not well for another nine months, reduced the dose to 140, and that patient's now almost two years on that dose reduction dose. Patient's doing well, um, still in remission. Um, side effects mostly subsided. Um, would you continue on the 140, increase to 280? increase to 420 or would you change at this point? I'm going to give you all a shot on this one. John. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I could be short or long here. I mean, I'm trying to figure out. But I, I, would, I would just continue on. I mean, uh, the nice thing that Ibrutinib has, particularly is weight-based dose, you know, and we know exactly how much drug you need to inhibit BTK 90% of the time. Uh, and the other agents haven't really necessarily well defined that. I, I don't doubt that lower doses of other agents um, are, aren't going to have good coverage in very frail 80-year-old patients by any means. Um, but we definitely know with, with ibrutinib, and it's about 2.5 mg per kg, uh, gets really good coverage. And so I think there's, I don't know all of the weight and the size of the patient, all these types of things, but clearly uh, history is telling us that uh, two years later there's, there's no progression and, and likely there's good coverage there. So if there's tolerating it and, and doing well and has otherwise low risk features, and I would just keep doing what's, what's going on with uh, 140. Yeah, pretty much the same. I mean, I think it's a missed opportunity, right, because we're never going to go back and do those studies. I think it's important that 
you know, based on the PK data from a lot of the, the different covalent BTK inhibitors, we know what the target was to inhibit over 90 percent, you know, BTK inhibition. What we don't know, or, you know, we've talked about this but never did that study, was to look at, well, can then later on, after you've done that, can you then lower the dose of these individuals because we've already occupied and fully saturated BTK and you may not need that dose anymore. And so that study will never get done because I'm sure the companies aren't going to want to do that anymore. But the point is probably so. And so I think in this patient, if they're doing otherwise doing well on reduced dosing, I would keep them. We talked about I think alluded to earlier, John alluded to the fact that obviously if you have an intolerance, can you switch to a different BTK? Sure, you can. So, but it sounds like this patient's already doing okay on yeah. reduced dosing. So I think that's fine. And somebody who's been on a brucinib for this long, it's highly likely there's going to be a new emerging right. adverse uh, agreed. event at this point. Absolutely so agree. Yeah. Also, I can just state so uh, Janssen, I think, has uh, announced a, a study, the Taylor study, where they are. They are uh, looking at ibrutinib, venetoclax, and ibrutinib, uh, and they're randomizing patients to continuing full dose or, or, or dose reducing it. So there are some studies doing it, and, and there have been other sm studies in the, in the past that have looked at it, um, but that's probably going to be the most definitive answer, does going to 280 diminish cardiovascular events, these kind of nuisance toxicities, and maintain efficacy, basically. And obviously with a calor and Xano, you have the dosing, you know, you, uh, calor is twice a day, Xano could be once or twice a day, so you can have one dose reduction with either of them, but that's it. Yeah. So. Well, here's an interesting question. We had our case scenarios looking at kind of older patients with high-risk features, okay? So you've got a young, fit patient with mutated immunoglobulin genes now needing therapy. How do you treat them? Yeah, um, great uh, point. So mutated IGHV young fit patient. Um, this is uh, where we see, uh, you know, long-term follow-up from FCR really um, still several patients not progressing, really have that functional cure. Um, I will say in the clinic, um, I have not been using FCR even in this setting, although I think there, there's data to support its use and, and, and could, you know, could be part of the discussion and an option. Um, having said that, we see you know, emerging data, um, the, the Gaia study um, looking um, at um, recently published, looking at the novel agents now uh, really whether it's doublet or triplet combinations, having excellent outcomes. Um, and so I really would favor a novel agent-based uh, approach. I think this is a patient population where a time-limited therapy, um, giving these patients a shot. So for standard of care in the US, that would be venetoclax, obinutuzumab per CLL14, or a clinical trial uh, with a triplet combination or a doublet combination that's time-limited is important because you're not committing them um, to the cumulative toxicities, for example, of a covalent BTK inhibitor. Um, but curious to know kind of the practice of others in this favorable risk subgroup. Agreed. Uh, I, I definitely would offer its young, you know, favorable patient population a time-limited approach unless they didn't want it. Other than that, I think that would be, you know, give these, give these folks a time off of therapy. They're going to do well long-term. They're easily salvageable. That's what I would favor on that individual. Yeah. yeah, yeah, similar. Well, it's probably the person at the table who's given most FCR. <laughs> I, I, I can't disagree more. I'm just completely reminded that the last patient I persuaded to have FCR who had was young and, and was um, mutated and wanted ibrutinib, I convinced him to take FCR and he tolerated it less well than anyone I've ever given FCR to my entire life and reminds me every time I see him oh. that be careful what you do. Um, but, I mean, you're absolutely right. We've got that data from the MD Anderson and now also from CLL8 of that group of, that, there is that group of patients in whom, if we can say anyone might be cured of, of their CLL, are that group of patients treated with, um, with FCR. We haven't got anything like that duration of therapy with, um, of, of, of follow-up with the CLL14 cohort, obviously. But at the moment, that's the cohort that's sitting up there high still, and there's still a significant number of MRD negative patients giving you the suggestion that you may well start to see the same kind of thing happening. It's the other groups of patients that are falling off on CLL14. And we have Dr. Griever here, so we have to thank him for PCR as well. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, I'd certainly be having a conversation with, pe with the per people about it, but I, I think most people would, would favor it. And of course, the other thing to consider is um, not just the toxicities of 
my own patient, but you know, the, the long-term follow-up in terms of things like risk of, of MDS. So um, there are other factors there, but it's a quite like, complicated conversation, John. Yeah, and, and in CLO 13, and I don't know if we'll see an updated, uh, uh, Dr. Icor said on one of the initial presentations, had a, that subgroup of young, 60, less than 65, and IGHV mutated, getting the VEN-based therapies versus FCR. FCR was doing very well, yeah. Yeah. but VEN-G and the triplets were doing just as well, if not better, and that, for me, really sent it, like there's no, no role, because you can get the fixed duration without that toxicity issue. Um, um. Well, we haven't got CAR-T yet, but if you've got a patient you're taking to CAR-T on a clinical trial, was, it would, would, uh, would, would pertubrutin, but another non-covalent, be your idea of a kind of, you know, best bridging therapy towards CAR-T? That is a great question. Um, we don't have too much data on uh, therapies even after pertubrutinib. Um, not even as a bridging strategy, but just thinking. There, there is some data out there um, that looks at patients getting CAR after discontinuing Pirto for disease progression. Um, there's data about a brutinib combined with certain CD19-directed uh, CAR T cell therapy, um, and there's some suggestion that maybe uh, the abrutinib uh, profile could be better in terms of T cell mediation effects than a drug like pirtabrutinib. Um, but I think, you know, it's a reasonable strategy if you have pirtabrutinib available um, and you need something to give, you know, while the cells are manufactured uh, to give pirtabrutinib. Um, I think now that it's available, it's a good option, but not a lot of data there. Sure. John? I was just going to say, you know, uh, the transcend, you know, we, IWCLL criteria, the CR rate's about 18%, mm. I think it was. And yeah. those patients did well, but that's only 18%. Yeah. And when you look at upcaritimab, which is only 30 patients treated, but that CR rate per IWCLL is twice that. Mm. And so I, I do think that production of T-cells plus the CLL uh, T-cell and, and whatever that production part of this issue that we have, I think could affect the, the quality there. And it's something that with bispecifics necessarily, it seems like maybe there's, the, there's uh, improved efficacy uh, we're still using that CLL T-cell. So it's something that to, to weed out, but if I've got a bispecific or a CAR-T, toxicity-wise, bispecifics are still winning there and, and logistics and all that kind of stuff. So I think, Plus, we've got the graders and all these all small molecule inhibitors that we can keep kind of just going with these with these drugs. And so I think CAR T, I don't I don't know. Uh, have I sent patients there? I think it's there. I would like it as a tool, right? But uh, it's not benefiting a lot of patients, and there is toxicity. It's sort of a, a little bit of an unfortunate story because CAR T keeps getting moved. Yeah. Um, and, and not all of our older, frailer patients might be eligible for CAR-T. So certainly, have I bridged or younger patients with PERTO? I have to CAR-T. Uh, but, but John is alluding to the fact that there are multiple agents, and so it's becoming a little bit of a muddier, trickier playing field, for sure. And there is another great abstract. Uh, you know, the question about Benda and CAR-T uh, rears its head, where that causes problem. There is a lot of Benda use in CLL. It, it doesn't seem to be affecting in lymphoma, uh, the Benda exposure with bispecifics, at least from the abstract that's being shown. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that and kind of understanding that a little bit more, because that's, uh, uh, you know, an area of interest and uh, not, not well understood. Because we've all seen the data on what ibrutinib does to T cell function, and we've seen the, the use, as you've alluded to, Megan, of using the ibrutinib with the CAR T. I'd love to see a lot more data on what the other BTK inhibitors do. I do not believe that ITK alone is the story of, um, of, of, of T cell function changes in CLL, and I think there's a lot of data emerging now that, per, that at least that calibrutinib and xanabrutinib also have T cell modulatory effects. I haven't seen anything yet on pertubrutin, but I'm sure Lily are doing, yeah. supporting some studies looking at this. Um, it'd be interesting to see, you know, um, certainly when I've got a patient going to CAR T, I'm looking for an excuse exactly. to put them on ibrutinib at least, uh, just uh, even if they're already refractory, just in the hope that I'm going to be doing something. And I think the same thing's probably going to be true on bispecifics, um, because in the end, you still need effective T cells, which is the one thing that we know that CLL patients often don't have. Sure. It's quite surprising for T cells that aren't functional, how much CRS they can get quickly though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so um, 
Again, we talked a lot about MRD and its importance, and I guess its major importance is being looking to be able to tell your patient they're MRD negative. <laughs> um, what do we do more about if they're still positive? And how in your are, are you in your practice, John? Are you using MRD to kind of modulate what you're going to be thinking about doing? Uh, yeah, I, so I don't know, I always feel bad about this question because I, I use it a lot and all the time, honestly. And I'm not living in a vacuum. I understand in most places, you know, access and all these things are, are not available. But I, I find it very useful. Uh, I find it's data, it's information, it's prognostic. Uh, but we are, um, you know, learning, and I have seen, and I'm building experience and understanding kinetics of, of these clones, et cetera, uh, and it does potentially influence the discussion that I have at that end of treatment if you're MRD positive, et cetera. So uh, I, at least in the U.S. Uh, and in, in our practice in New York City, obviously we don't see lots of reimbursement issues, um, and so I, I do use it. I'm typically using uh, NGS and, and uh, a clonoseq assay to do it, and we're learning uh, CLL13. I think they show data that's not, the depth of remission is starting to matter and, and getting to the 10 minus mm -hmm. six, and so what does that drive to MRD negativity mean into the future, and do we need to get everybody there? I do think it's very important uh, if you're using a fixed duration to try to achieve it in any way, manner, uh, shape, or form. Yeah. I, I agree it really applies to the venetoclax fixed duration regimens, but I think, you know, one thing that comes up is, like, should you check it with a covalent BTK inhibitor monotherapy? And I think there's really, like, limited use there. And, and so, um, again, investigational, not standard of care. And I think it's almost regimen specific at this point, you know, what it means, not only what assay are you using, what sensitivity, but also what regimen are you checking it on and, and what's the data there. I can say I, I do, do use it in BTK patients as well, and uh, it, you know, antidotes. But you can I've caught non-compliance with it. I've mm. seen the MRD rising, and it's a young patient. I'm like, are you really taking this? And they're like, yeah, you caught me. And then sure enough, they go back on, and it's coming down. Not that that's a reason to do it, but it's information again, and you can potentially impact a, a progression. And I and I do I just caught a patient who was about eight years on ibrutinib, and then MRD three years prior actually started to rise. The ALC was normal, but it went from three to five to 15%, and then he came in uh, and the ALC was 15 and, and true progression. So you, you start to understand we don't modify necessarily what we're doing, but again, uh, you're not shocked or surprised when something happens and, and uh, at least you can react uh, quickly and, and uh, with knowledge. Well, that's controversial. <laughs> too. I'd love to hear it, yeah, yeah. No, 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 in a good way, meaning, right, so it, for those patients that we do know who are on a covalent BTK inhibitor and do start having evidence of progressive disease, whether that be by you checking MRD or there's, a, there's some of those individuals who you could argue could still be monitored, um, and, right? And so that's, three that's years, a whole yes. other question, yes. right? And then the, the question is, or do you wait or do you, or do you switch their therapy sooner? And so I think that sequencing of therapies, you know, whether, you know, you start one on the rise of MRD or versus true progression via IWCLO criteria is something that also we need to, you know, adequately address. And part of that will be dependent, I think, also on regimen because you might not want to wait until somebody gets so bulky that you have to worry about. That's why I'm smiling. Right? I'm You're smiling? I'm, well, I'm smiling because I sit on the IWCLO <laughs> committee and we're rewriting the guidelines right now and we're arguing about this Correct. very issue. The IWCLO criteria are very clear about when you wait for progression, but do you really want to wait mm -hmm. that long for a patient to progress that you're going to put on venetoclax and you're going to wait till they're high risk? Till they're high risk. Um, or might you get a better approach if you know you're going to treat them earlier? By God, I'd probably get myself thrown off the committee for saying this publicly. But, you know, the big, the big question is, you know, why no other disease setting do we wait for the patient to become bulky before we treat them again? So mm -hmm. in that setting, you know, could, and particularly if I'm going to use a BCL2 inhibitor, I'm really probably not going to wait until so they're, they're so, real. So they're high risk. But there's some individuals who can go a really long time. Yeah, yeah, totally. Exactly. And still have not high risk disease. And so that's, you know. But I guess what the question is really alluding to Ultimately. is, are there those people in whom you would not think about retreatment, but would you, how would you modify right. the treatment you're already on and not exactly. wait for a progression? And I, I, I guess we might all be tempted to do it and we might do it and sometimes won't publicly admit to it, but the, 
issue is it's probably a lack of evidence that, uh, right. that would make us hesitate to say this Absolutely. is the right or the not the Absolutely. right thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and ultimately, does that improve PFS and overall survival or their time to net? You know, this is the, the questions we need to get at with data. Yep. One more, oh, last question, okay. <laughs> um, thinking of patients not progressing, so that patient who's very slow to respond, very persistent lymphocytosis after BTK inhibitor. Uh, John, I start with you. I keep going to Megan all the time because she's on the far end for me. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think they, they always give us some, some concern. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes we push these white counts up to three, four hundred thousand. Uh, and in those types of patients, uh, it can take two to three years yeah. to normalize it. Yeah. But if you stick with it, I mean, it ratchets down every time they come in. It's really when you start to see it plateau. But these PRLs, uh, you know, haven't really necessarily... Uh, shown that they have some inferior uh, long-term outcome, and, and obviously with high-risk features, you might might think about the patient differently. But I I stay the course, and and it uh, it comes down, and, and it can normalize, but it can take years. I know early data was like median about nine months, which is kind of what the expectation is. But there are patients, especially when you push them really high, that take some time. So all that remains for me um, is to be able to thank uh, fabulous faculty we've had today. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash YUZ860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AbbVie, AstraZeneca, Lilly, and Pharmacyclics LLC, an AbbVie company, and Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs LLC.